This is Fit to Succeed in partnership with NordicFitnessEducation.com with hosts Ben Pratt. So for factory farming, it's maybe 3% of carbon emissions, and that's factory farming, which we all know is terrible. Um, it certainly isn't 12%, and it's not 25%, and it's not 47%, and these numbers just, but it gets inflated each time somebody sends it around. Okay, and welcome to another episode of the Fit to Succeed show. I am pleased today to be able to welcome to the show a guest who has been well known for her food activism, her environmentalism, and also she is an author. She's the author of a book that was published about 10 years ago called The Vegetarian Myth. Her name is Lier Keith. Lier, welcome to the Fit to Succeed show. Great. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Such a pleasure. Now, we were just speaking just before we started recording here that uh, I first came across your work perhaps around the time that your book was first published. And we're now a decade on from that. And I still think that the subject matter that you talked about in the book is still very relevant today. Um, I wonder if you could perhaps summarize just as a way of us maybe getting to know you a little bit. If you could summarize briefly the impact that publishing the book, The Vegetarian Myth, has had upon your life since that date. Um, well, there's always positives and negatives in life. Um, the positives certainly have outweighed the negatives. The negatives is, is just that there's, you, you talk about food and it's like religion or politics, you know, it just explodes. And people have very, sometimes very harsh uh, responses when, you know, their, their ideas are crossed. So that is always a challenge. I get a lot of hate mail. Um, I've, you know, been through quite a lot of, um, say, not particularly nice uh, experiences uh, with, mm. with vegan sense. Um, I have to speak with security um, present because I've been assaulted. Um, you know, I just, there's always death threats before I'm going to be anywhere. So I just have to always take that in mind now. And I did not realize it was going to be that bad. Wow. I'm somebody who spent 20 years in that world, but I honestly did not know that it was going to be at that level against me. So well, that's a drag, but on the positive side, um, the book has been wildly popular. It's my publisher's number one selling title still, which is amazing. Um, and really the reason that matters to me is because I, I wanted to reach the next generation of impassioned, engaged young people before they did this to themselves. I wanted them to understand that this was not a way forward and that if they did it long term, they were going to end up with permanent physical damage, because that's what happened to all of us who tried it long term. So it's already, the experiment has already been run. They don't need to do it, you know, on their own. Like they're allowed to learn from what we've already been through. And I wanted to lay out the reasons why. Like these are all the reasons that, that this is not actually the best way to institute um, the values that you hold dear, because those values are correct. So that's never the issue. The problem is how do we best embody them? And a vegan diet, as it turns out, is not that. So Anyway, I just, I really, really, it was just, that was my survivor mission was to reach out to those people, especially, and explain why this wasn't going to work, that it's really a dead end. And there are better, much better options out there to yeah. address all of that. So. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And, you know, uh, it, it doesn't take too much searching on Amazon to see that your book has been very popular, you know, more than 500 reviews and, uh, and those mostly over four stars. So uh, it, it's very clear that the book has had some impact. Now, I wonder you kind of alluded there, Lier, that you obviously came from that world. You were a vegetarian and a vegan for quite a long period of time. Um, is there anything in particular that you loved or enjoyed about that lifestyle, making those choices with regards to your diet? Yes, and those things are still true. So I loved feeling like with such a simple act, like eating, what I was choosing to purchase, that I was making the world better. And I certainly thought that was true when I was a vegan. As it turns out, it wasn't true. But what I eat now, it is actually true. So um, I still have that sense of happiness that I'm able to do this one thing that, um, you know, it's a minuscule level, our, our personal decisions. But I like that one. You know, it makes me feel very satisfied on a daily basis that, um, you know, I can build a little topsoil and restore a little habitat and I can do and support local farms and all of that. So those are all good things and I'm happy to do them and they make me happy. So um, that part, there, there, there was that sort of two, three years in the middle, like when the vegan thing crashed and then I had no idea what to think about anything at all. Um, the thing that made it better was realizing that 
I could still do that. Like I could still have that kind of completeness and feel like, you know, my personal decisions were actually going towards something good um, by instead eating things like grass fed beef. Mm-hmm. In fact, really were going to repair the world. So that that's good. Like that's, and that always made me happy about being a vegan, like feeling like I could do that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I just, I guess I just like being engaged, you know, just intellectually engaged, emotionally engaged with what I'm doing. And um, I felt very politically motivated as a vegan, and that certainly carries through to what I am now post-vegan, that I, I can still feel that way, that, um, you know, I'm engaged with really good people who are trying to change the world, mm-hmm. and that is, I don't know, that just sort of is what supports me all the time, so mm-hmm. that's a good thing. And perhaps just to give some some further context, how long, because I believe if I remember right, it was a while ago I read your book, if I remember right, the, you started life as a vegetarian and then you gradually progressed and then you became a vegan. How, how long did you no. invest time-wise in both? Uh-uh. I like was enough? in head first. I Where was a you? vegan from day one. Yeah, I, I, met a, I was 16 years old. I met another teenage girl who was a vegan. Her whole family was into being vegan mm-hmm. and it didn't take two weeks. I was utterly convinced and that was it. I didn't look back. So mm-hmm. 20 years, just full on. Um, yeah, I never went through the vegetarian part first. It was just, oh, this is terrible. How can I, you know, what can I do about it? Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, she had great propaganda and she had all the right things to say. And I was very convincible at 16 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. You know, the sad part is that I, you know, I lived in this very kind of urban environment. I had no idea where food came from. So when she presented these things as facts, um, I didn't really have any counterweight to it. Mm-hmm. It seemed true. And let's all just say factory farming is horrible. Like that part is still true, but pretty much everything else she told me is completely not true. I just, I had no way to know that at age 16 and certainly the internet didn't exist. So, you know, I just, I found the propaganda, you know, like I read Francis Moore LePay and all the vegetarian books, the vegan books, and it just made such a convincing argument. And I, I had no way to like check the facts on it. So I just believed. And the moment you're in that it's really hard to get back out Like, because you're, I mean, I don't know about all your listeners, but I mean, I was that kind of just, you know, absolutely hardcore, you know, kind of self-righteous teenager. And it was like, I was just going to do it. So it was, there wasn't really any talking me out of it at that point. So, yeah, I certainly think it's probably very common, isn't it? That when we uh, decide or put ourselves in a particular group or position, or we label ourselves with a particular stance, we very quickly surround ourselves. It's human nature, isn't it? Surround yourselves with people who agree. It's very hard not to, uh, to see that confirmation bias in our lives and that everybody else, perhaps who doesn't agree, isn't really seeing all of the information to hand. So I, I can totally understand that position, though it does raise a question, which is when you, your two decades were uh, as a vegan, I just wonder why did you call the book The Vegetarian Myth and not The Vegan Myth? Um, because I wanted to talk to vegetarians too. You know, it's, there's a lot of crossover between those two worlds. I don't know that there's a hard line sometimes between them. Most vegetarians want to be vegans. Everybody admits that it's the best, the most, most righteous, you know, the most eco-friendly, the most politically correct, whatever. So everyone's always, you know, veering toward that. All my friends who were vegetarians, I certainly had higher status because I was the hardcore vegan. Um, you know, and everybody admitted that, you know, oh, God, Lier is just so perfect about this. So you, you do get that, you know, like you're at the, the top of the kind of the social scale in that world. So I wanted to reach them all. And, and the arguments are pretty much the same. It's like mm-hmm. politically, economically, um, ecologically, and certainly for your health. You, you can last a little bit longer as a vegetarian because um, you're getting some animal products, but ultimately you're going to see the same kind of damage. So. Okay. And that, that's a really nice introduction to perhaps where I'd like to go next, which I think for the listeners who perhaps haven't read your book, maybe we could just cover uh, fairly briefly some of the key concepts that you uh, share in your book. Uh, you, you divide the book into three major sections. You talk first about moral veganism, or sorry, vegetarianism, uh, political vegetarianism, and nutritional vegetarianism. I wonder if you could just summarize, what do you mean when somebody is taking a stance of being a moral vegetarian? So that's the idea that if you eat a vegan diet, no sentient beings are having to die. They're not being harmed for you in any way. That that there's a way to do that as a human being, that you can eat food in which there's no death or no animal suffering. And it's completely not true, but it's really fun to believe it. I mean, it feels really good to think, no animals got hurt. Look at this peaceful, wonderful plate in front of me. There's not a single dead animal on this plate. Nobody was exploited. Isn't this the most perfect food ever? And it's it's a relief. 
I mean, in a way, to think, wow, I don't have to participate in that destruction, and death just seems so horrible, and I love animals. Who wouldn't love animals? They're wonderful. So yeah. they're my kin. I don't want to hurt them. And that was like half the thing for me, is like, I don't want to hurt any animals. So it seemed obvious that veganism was the way to go. You know, as I came to find out, it's not possible. If you're alive, something died to feed you. Um, and that was a, a terrible, terrible reckoning that I had 20 years on. Um, I was way too old to not know that already. You know, like I should have known that when I was four years old. You know, I, at any other point in human history, I, that would have been just the knowledge, just the daily knowledge of our lives, and also the spiritual knowledge that for something to live, something else has to die. And no matter what you're eating, there are dead animals involved. And really, the only option is: are you going to do it well, or are you going to do it horribly? And to be a good person is to do it well, is to you know bear up under our adult responsibilities, um, and you know just accept that this is what it is. We there's always death on every plate. Mm -hmm. Whether you see it or not isn't actually the issue. You know you can pretend for a while, like I did, but ultimately there are many many dead animals in every single thing you eat. So. Is it the death that's a part of the cycle of life? Are you making that cycle stronger or are you killing everything on the planet? Those are really our options. So it's like the good death versus the bad death or mm -hmm. the ancient Greeks had two words for life and one is bios and one is zoe. So one is life as a whole and one is the individual life. And I think the problem with a lot of vegans is it's the focus is on the individual life. Well, there's not a single dead animal on this plate, therefore it's death-free food. And it's not true because for bios to continue, there are plenty of dead animals in that food. You just don't want to do the reckoning. Mm -hmm. So I recall in your book, you talk quite a lot about the use of modern fertilizers to be able to create uh, you know, growth in plants at the rate that's needed to feed the world. And that fertilizers themselves obviously come from you know, many dead things, including animals and plants. Um, that was a real, that was a terrible moment for me as a vegan because I was trying to grow my own food and you realize very quickly that as an organic gardener your only choices are manure, <laughs> blood meal and bone meal. Soil wants animals, that's what it is, it's dead plants and animals hmm. acted upon by bacteria that break it down and you know make it available again to the cycle of life but that's literally what soil is and I it was it just blew my mind I mean I was so traumatized learning about this as a vegan it was horrible, but mm. it's reality. So there's not any way out. I mean, I, I kept trying, like, you know, my ideology is the sledgehammer and I can keep pounding reality with my sledgehammer. Reality doesn't care. It's not going to give because mm. I want the world to be different. It's not. This is how life has evolved. Mm. Just take it or leave it. You can see the beauty and the sorrow at the same time, but it's not going to change because I want it to. Mm -hmm. And another aspect I think to, to add on to that is that you know, there's been uh, studies done on the amount of uh, small animal life, insect animal oh, life yeah. that is killed in large scale agriculture as well. Yeah. Uh, and that often is ignored. Um, but uh, as I understand, you actually, you know, lived and tried to grow your own stuff so that you weren't engaging in large scale agriculture. Is that right? Yeah, but I mean, it comes down to the same thing. Like, If I'm going to take over this piece of land and just grow a human on it, um, I am now in competition with a whole bunch of other creatures mm -hmm. and it was grim. It was grim. I fought a nightly battle with slugs and I lost because I wasn't willing to kill them. Mm -hmm. um, and I gave up. I had to give up one summer entirely. Was, I kept planning. It didn't matter. They, every night they came back and they ate it all to the ground because that's what slugs do. That's what they eat. And it was really hard. So I gave up. Like I tried to kill them. I couldn't do it. I was too vegan. It just, I wasn't going to do it. it was murder. I couldn't do it. Right. So I gave up. I was like, all right, well, I just won't have, I won't have lettuce. I won't have all this stuff in my garden. Oh, it was such a relief. And then I went to the grocery store and I literally picked up a head of lettuce. Right? I can just buy it. It's so easy. I don't have to think about it. And it was like, I grew up in that moment. It was like, are you serious? You have tried now to grow lettuce. You know what's involved. You can pay somebody else to do it for you and pretend there's no death in this lettuce. But mm -hmm. if this lettuce is worth eating, oh yeah, a whole bunch of animals were killed so that you could have it. You can't pretend anymore. Mm -hmm. And it was really grim, but also there's something just affirming about facing the truth, you know, because I ran from it. You know, every time I came up against that same kind of barrier of, no, I need to be the good person that's not killing animals. That information is too terrifying. I'm going to leave it over there. You know, I kept doing that as a vegan. Like, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. And here I, you know, I made these claims that I was the person who was facing all the terrible truths of the world. And I wasn't. Mm 
-hmm. And that moment in the grocery store holding that lettuce, like I grew up 20 years right then, like, of course things are dying to feed you. Like literally that's the cycle of life. You have to just face it so you can do it well. And it was honestly, it was so sad, but it was also such a relief. Like, all right, well, now I can just choose to do it well. So I got chickens and ducks and they did great. Like they ate every slug. I got to have my lettuce. They fertilized the soil. Like the cycle was complete. Mm -hmm. But it meant, you know, involving animals. Like you, the planet, you can't have a living planet without animals. Like what are we doing? Taking over entire continents, driving the animals off and then just growing monocrops for humans. Like, that mm -hmm. is going to collapse. The soil can't last forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, in fact, the soil lasts between 800 and 2000 years. That is the length of every civilization. And then they collapse because mm -hmm. it's an inherently destructive activity. So I found that out kind of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, yeah, fascinating. So, yeah. I wonder if we could uh, change gears then, because the moral arguments I, I feel sometimes are the most emotive. But you sure. also mentioned the political arguments or the political side to being vegetarian. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on that? So, you know, what you hear as a vegan or a vegetarian, and also now a lot of the global warming activists will say things like, it takes 16 pounds of grain to raise a cow, like get a, a, a pound of protein from a cow. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously wrong. Um, we should give all that grain to people and keep the cows out of it. Um, and then the whole world could be fed. And it's a very simple argument. I believed it myself for 20 years. Not a single piece of it is true. That's the problem. <laughs> so number one, why are there starving people in places like Cambodia? Um, and why should they be dependent on us for food? I mean, that's a relationship that's, it's imperialism. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's what it is. Mm -hmm. It means that the West has taken over those places, turned them into colonies, destroyed their capacity to feed themselves because they know how to feed themselves. They've been doing it for thousands of years, like everybody else, um, and then made them dependent on this economic system so they have to do things like make sneakers or build computer chips in horrible factories and then with the pennies they get in return they have to then buy food from the center of empire which is the united states um, this is not in any way a relationship of justice and in any other circumstance anybody left of center would understand that this is indeed imperialism it's colonialism it's everything that we're against but when it comes to food suddenly it's the model we're after it's insane right like we would all know that that's not right except suddenly when vegetarians say it, we all believe it so no people in cambodia don't want to be dependent on the united states for food and the only reason that they are dependent on for food is because there are six corporations that essentially control the world food supply and they are able to drive the price of the grain below the cost of production. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the kind of prices they can demand. And what it means is they go into places like the Philippines, like Cambodia, like India, wherever they can go, um, and they put all the local producers out of business. So communities that could once feed themselves no longer can because those giant corporations just keep undercutting the food supply. And we call that agricultural dumping, actually a name for it. And human rights and food activists the world over have begged, pleaded, and begged some more at the UN, <laughs> before the US Congress, before everywhere, saying, could you just stop agricultural dumping, please? We need to be able to support ourselves. Our farmers need to be able to provide food for our population. Mm -hmm. And they lose. And that's what you know globalization is all about. So they've been losing. Um, and what it means is that the farmers lose their land, they get pushed into urban squalor, um, they lose their cultures. Like, it's just a slow form of genocide. Mm -hmm. This is not a relationship based on justice. And I, it's insane to me that I ever believed that this was the way forward. It's not. The worst thing you can do to hungry people is undercut their local food supply. And that's what's been happening for the last 50 years. So, and, and hence you have these just huge, swollen urban slums, places you know, in Pakistan and in India and wherever. That's why they're in Mexico City, it's because the people on the land have been driven off and they have no other options to survive but to try to get to a city, see if they can make it there. But it's absolutely wrenching, you know, destruction of all their indigenous traditional cultures. And then the land is destroyed by you know, giant agribusiness. So this doesn't make sense, you know, in, in any way. And, you know, again, it's, it's an easy statement to make, oh, 60 pounds of grain, but that's not reality. That's not actually what's driving it. Mm -hmm. um, the other problem with 
I mean, those statistics that they're simply not true. I mean, even in horrible conditions like factory farming, um, there's only about 13% of what those animals are fed could be eaten by humans. The rest is honestly agricultural waste products. It's things we can't digest. It's cellulose. It's the stuff we don't want. So there's not even that much of it that's actually going to animals. Um, and then the third thing is the reason we have factory farming is because of this vast surplus of grain that was created by the so-called Green Revolution. So in 1950, uh, a lot of the plants that during the, the Second World War were making essentially bombs for the war effort, they converted to peacetime activities. And so it's all about nitrogen. It's all about using nitrogen for explosives. So instead, they switched to making nitrogen fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And then the plant breeders got on it and figured out how to make things like wheat and rice super short with huge seed heads. Uh, at this point, you can't go any further. The plants will just break. Um, but that's what they did. So between the breeding these super duper weird plants and then applying this incredible amount of fossil fuel, they were able to quadruple the world harvest mm -hmm. of grain, basic grain stuffs. Um, what that meant, of course, was that the human population also quadrupled. It's not like we fed people better. Um, we just made the problem four times worse. Like that's not actually what helps. So, I mean, the whole model was wrong. It's also completely dependent on fossil fuel hint there's not any more of it <laughs> it's a so finite quantity <laughs> like, i know like it's gonna run out whether it's this year or 10 years from now or 20 like who cares the exact date it's gonna happen and we're in mm -hmm. utter denial about that but that created this huge mountain of corn and that's what created factory farming mm -hmm. that mountain of corn like you know pennies on the pound like it was never been that cheap before in all of human history and all of a sudden there's so much that they can't even give it away and now it makes economic sense to keep animals in completely bizarre, horrifying conditions, feed them a bunch of crap, they get really fat really fast, which means meat is cheap. So this being capitalism, that's what they did. But that's yeah. why factory farming exists. It's not because animals naturally want to eat this stuff. It's not a natural diet for a cow. A cow is designed to eat grass. Yeah, so per comparison in the first All place, by the sounds of it. Yeah, so I mean, the whole thing is like just a massive mess out there, but the vegetarian version of it doesn't match reality. Like, it's not the flow of power, it's not what's going to fix it, it's not why the problem exists. Like, mm -hmm. none of these, and, and most of the facts are wrong. So, it doesn't actually match reality. Mm -hmm. Sure. Appreciate that. That was a, that was a very uh, clear <laughs> and uh, perhaps overwhelming message as we talk about the political factors. Uh, we, as individuals, it, it often feels like, well, what can I do about some of those things? Um, what do you mean then by the, your third section in the book, which is nutritional vegetarianism? I, I appreciate, again, this could be a huge area, but maybe just briefly yeah. summarize this. So one of the reasons that I was compelled to go vegan, um, half of it was definitely the animal suffering and certainly the world hunger issue, you know, were very compelling. But the third part of it was these claims they make about how it's going to help your health. And at that point, at least in the United States, we had had this thing called the McGovern Commission in the mm -hmm. early 70s. And um, that was where they came out and said, oh, everybody should eat a low fat, high carb diet. So in school, that's what we all learned. And I was 15, 16 years old. And we learned that you shouldn't eat any animal products. If you do, it should be low fat everything. Skim milk is all you should ever have. If you don't, you're going to get heart disease and diabetes and cancer and die. Um, and that was just chilling. I, there's a lot of diabetics in my family and I had a great aunt who had a leg amputated. Like it was horrifying and like, oh, this is how I can fix this. And those horrible things will never happen to me. I just have to eat this other way. And then I met the other young vegan and I was like, okay, now I have all the answers I need. So boom, I went in. But the nutrition thing here, I mean, it's an experiment they ran on the American public for two, three decades. The entire thing collapsed. I mean, they've all come around now and said, like, we didn't really have any research or the research we had was profoundly flawed. You know, they pulled back from this just every single year. There's another huge study and another sort of, you know, outcomes, another sort of public relations spin from one of these big kind of, you know, public interest groups. But it, it all comes down to the same thing. Like, animal fats have been they're off i mean every it's there it is like on the cover of time magazine that you know they were very unfairly blamed for these diseases that mm -hmm. they're protective of those diseases the traditional fats are protective fats they they are the ones that keep us healthy um and you can't get them if you're a vegetarian a, veg, a vegan certainly and it's hard as a vegetarian um and that's really what's kept the human race healthy we 
Yeah, and then you just do a little bit of research about our actual digestive tracts and what they look like and who they compare to. And it's not cows. We don't have four stomachs. It's wolves. We look a lot like that. So um, yeah, but but that was very compelling to me as well. That you know, if you just do this simple thing of taking out animal products, you won't have these terrible health problems. Yeah, and right. instead, you know, in the service of that, I ended up permanently a mess. But whatever, live and learn. <laughs> so I think probably the, the the most powerful nutritional arguments tend to be, uh, you know, uh, that animal fats are or animal products, I should say, I'm not going to just focus on fats, animal products are the things that are responsible primarily for increased cancer and for increased cardiovascular disease. They tend to be the most powerful arguments that people choose to move away from animal foods towards more and more plant foods. Now, I think it's also important to, to preface that by saying, you know, nobody's saying that plant foods aren't healthy for us. Plant foods, of course, are good for us, but it's the choice of saying that animal foods cannot support health. And I, I believe that's what you're getting at. Yeah, so I mean, we could get into specifics, but there's a huge range of nutrients that you really can only get from animal foods. They don't exist in plants. Plants don't need them. They don't make them. They've got no use for them. Um, if you don't eat some animals, you're not going to get them. So vitamin A, vitamin D, K2 is kind of iffy, B12 certainly, um, CoQ10, heme iron, just basic iron. The kind that your red blood cell really wants is the kind that comes from red meat can't really get it anywhere else your body will try but um you know there it is like moment to moment you you can't live without oxygen and that's what does it is that heme iron the red blood cell is actually an amazing thing if if you ever want to look up like any of your listeners if you if you'd like to like geek out on this stuff it's just this amazing thing the shape is incredible and then that little iron just sitting right in the middle of it and that's what grasps the iron and then releases it to the cells that need it. And mm -hmm. without heme iron, it just, it's a mess in there. Like it just isn't going to work as well. So anemia, there you go. Um, yeah. So there's just this whole list of, you know, and, and then just basic fat cholesterol, you have to have it. Every single cell in your body, the membrane around that cell, what gives our body structural integrity is cholesterol. Mm -hmm. uh, your bot, your brain is almost 80% fat. We know what happens to people on vegetarian and vegan diets. Their brains shrink literally they lose the weight of their brains shrinks the size of their brain shrinks. you can lose uh it's a fifth of your brain you can lose um after a few years of this that's how much yeah. weight will be lost from your brain that's some bone um, claims i'd love to, where, where did you come just, across that oh that study was actually done at um in the uk at oh, really? um yeah at oxford i can send you the link if you want to see it yeah, um, yeah they studied sure. all these it was mostly old people in a like in a nursing in a care home situation so they were able to really tell what they were eating and then the ones who were vegetarian or vegan the vegan ones did absolutely the worst the vegetarians not so great and of course people eating a regular diet with some animal products in it um didn't have that kind of brain shrinkage so this is something that's like you know two and a half million years in the making the human brain and yeah. all you have to do is not feed it and it will shrink because it's just there's not enough to go around yeah, I'd love it if you could send that. Uh, send that. I will absolutely. Yeah, it's called sure. the Oxford Study, I believe, but I, I can totally find that for you. Yeah, great stuff. That's great. Now, now that we've kind of set the the, the scene for for all the things that are in your book, and many of them are very emotive, which is perhaps why you you got that real mix of reactions, positive and negative. And um, what does your own dietary practices look like today? So you know, we're we're ten years on. What's a normal day in terms of uh, of your daily diet? So I eat what would be called a paleo diet or a keto diet. Um, I completely destroyed my insulin receptors. So I have to eat a low carb diet no matter what, or I feel really sick really fast. Mm -hmm. I cannot handle sugar. So it's just over. So I, even if I wanted to, I can't eat that stuff. Um, the thing to remember about carbohydrate is, you know, if it makes you feel better to say, well, it's a complex carbohydrate, go ahead and tell yourself that. But every last molecule of that complex carbohydrate is broken down into simple sugars in your digestive tract. That's how it gets through the brush barrier, how it gets into your bloodstream. It has to be broken down and that's what your guts do. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it might be a slightly smaller little spike in the day, but you know, meal after meal, if you're eating all that carbohydrate, you're just going to be living at way too high levels of insulin. Mm -hmm. As I found out, because I didn't eat sugar, I didn't eat white flour. I didn't do any of that as a vegan. I was so strict whole grains, whole beans, all of that. Um, I wouldn't even eat like jelly or ketchup if it had sugar in it. I mean, that's how strict I was. It didn't matter <laughs> through my insulin receptors because it's just sugar day after day after day, three, four, five times a day. It's all you're eating as a vegan. So 
yeah, so I can't do, I can't eat any, really any load of carbohydrate at all. So um, what I do eat is, um, I'm very lucky, I live in a rural area. Um, I've had a lot of my own animals as well. This very moment I don't, but I've raised my own chickens, ducks, mm -hmm. geese, all of that. I've had goats. Um, I'm very lucky living in a rural area, I can get grass-based, you know, pasture-based, really good quality animal products from all kinds of local farms. We even have a cheese factory here and they have their cheeses are all from local grass-based farms. So, I mean, I, I've really lucked out. I know that it's much easier for me than for other people, mm. but, um, so yeah, my diet is basically beef, eggs, good cheeses. Um, and I'm on the coast, so I get good fish. We, we have salmon here and sea so fish as a, well. So. so what, so what sort of plant foods then you, you sort of indicated that the starch here foods you probably have to avoid. No. What sort of plant <laughs> foods do you include in your diet regularly? Um, I'm, you know, I like vegetables. I'm one of those people who actually enjoys a great big salad. I know that's not everybody, mm. but, um, I actually like that. So every day there's definitely a large green leafy thing that is my generally my lunch is what I eat. I'm not a big fruit eater and I, I really can't tolerate it too much anyway. So there's no loss there. That's not something I crave. Um, but yeah, like fresh veggies are, I am happy fry them up in butter. You're good. Um, peas, beans, whatever, zucchini, whatever, whatever's fresh on the vine we can do. We don't have great tomatoes here cause it's too cool, but you can get little tiny tomatoes and those are usually pretty good. So. All right. So it sounds like a, like you, you really emphasize food quality and being able to source yeah. it from, uh, from somewhere nearby by the sounds of things. Yes. And it's very important. I mean, the number one question you should ask about your food is, does it build topsoil? Because if you can answer yes to that, they're doing everything else right. That's the key right there. If they're building topsoil, it means they're restoring habitat. Um, so all the other animals have a place to live now. They can all come home. The birds, the little mammals, the, you know, the reptiles, the amphibians, everybody. They're restoring the water table. So all the local waterways, the streams and rivers are going to have more good water in them, not water that's destroyed by the soil runoff. Um, every single time that those plants and animals build topsoil, um, we're sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. It's really the only hope our planet has is getting the ruminants and the grasses back together. It's, mm -hmm. that's the only way we're going to sequester that carbon and it can be done. It's not too late. It's, just, you know, do we have the political will for it? So every time that you buy, you know, grass fed beef, bison, whatever, pick your ruminant. I don't care. <laughs> um, you're doing it. You know, you are helping those farmers sequester carbon. So, mm -hmm. and then the animals will have good lives. That's what they want. A cow wants just her grass and she's happy. That is, you can feel the contentment on these animals. They have really happy lives that let them express their nature as ruminants. And that is, it's a joy to behold. So, so I take it yeah. from those comments that, the, that you also do not agree with the concept that by avoiding animal foods that we will improve uh, you know the environment in terms of carbon being released into the atmosphere because that's again one of the things we see a lot on the internet that that uh, you know animals are responsible for a huge amount of the carbon they're completely wrong um, that was based on one study um, where they compared apples and oranges so for the animal foods they compared they took everything into account, transportation, refrigeration, like everything. Mm -hmm. And then for the other sectors of the economy, they only use sort of point of purchase carbon release, not everything else. Right. Um, and after that study was released, it was actually the American Society of Chemists um, reran the numbers and said, you people at the UN, you got this completely wrong. You, you do see that. And they immediately admitted they were wrong. That's what's funny. Like they didn't, they were like, yep, we got it wrong completely. Your numbers are right. So for factory farming, it's maybe 3% of carbon emissions are from uh, the animals. And that's factory farming, which we all know is terrible. Um, it certainly isn't 12% and it's not 25% and it's not 47%. And these numbers just get, it's a vampire myth, but it gets inflated each time somebody sends it around. I've seen absolutely ridiculous memes about this. Um, and the study was, everybody agreed they did it wrong. Like within six months, they had said, yes, we draw that. It doesn't matter. Like the vegans took it and ran with it. And don't you think just, uh, that the current? True. Sorry, I was going to say. Don't you think the current circumstances uh, really highlight that point? Is now we're seeing so many cities around the world that have been locked down due to coronavirus are now reporting vastly improved, uh, you know, air quality all over the world. Yeah, air quality, and I mean, I love these stories about the wild animals that are suddenly on the streets. That just fills my heart with joy. Like they are here. They want to come home. We just have to get out of the way. And it also shows that if there's enough political will. If we realize we are dying, we'll do what's necessary. We've done it for the virus. Why can't we do it to repair the climate? Mm -hmm.
Yeah, that's a, that's a really fascinating point. You know, it certainly makes you think, that's for sure. Now, uh, uh, over time, I suppose everybody has the opportunity to learn more, to grow, to understand and develop, even experts. Uh, and one of the things uh, that often happens with, uh, with someone who's an author like yourself is that they record to the best of their knowledge and understanding in a book their views. But obviously, time passes, you can learn and develop, and perhaps those views can change. And I just wonder, if you were handed the opportunity today to rewrite the vegetarian myth for a second edition, would you make any changes? And if so, what would these be? There's even better research about how the heart, 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 the, the well, high fat heart hypothesis is wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so I would include more of that, more updated information. It's, you know, every study that comes out shows that there's, if there's any connection at all between cardiac health and diet, it's that higher fat diets are actually better, but it's animal fats. The polyunsaturates are terrible. Um, and that has just, you know, be, been made more and more clear. That's one thing I would update some of that because we have better information. Um, and then the other thing that I would include more is just the incredible stuff that's been done over the last decade to repair grasslands um, and prairie ecosystems and just how fast it can happen and how desperately important that is to save life on earth. That, that really is the only way we're going to sequester that carbon. But they're doing it. There's millions of acres now that are under that kind of repair, and the, ex the results are just extraordinary. It, it's, it's a miracle, and it's also not a miracle. It's just what life does, right? And this could be done everywhere. It's not actually that difficult to understand the principles, and most farmers the world over are desperate to figure out. I mean, they're, they're serfs, essentially, to the six corporations that control the world food supply, and they want to get out from under. It's just nobody's explained how. And this immediately can give people back their independence. Um, it gives the animals a happy life and it does the most important thing, which is it sequesters the carbon. So all of that can be done. And this is what I mean, like we're not out of hope. We just, it's always a question of political will. So if we could get even a few of the major institutions on the planet faced in the right direction, um, we could still do this. I'm, I'm not giving up yet, but I would include a lot more of that information in the book because a lot of that was just sort of kicking off when I got started. And now we have demonstration sites everywhere that are really showing how this is done and how incredible it is. Um, it is it's very doable. So, Yeah, fantastic. And, uh, you know, I think you also raised the point there that, that sometimes, I, I think sometimes in our modern lives, we, we don't mean to, but we inadvertently separate good nutrition and eating effectively for our bodies and the farming that needs to take place in order to, uh, to do that. And I, maybe it's easier for people to do that, but I, I found over the last 15 or 20 years that I've really been getting into nutrition that, that you just can't. To learn one, you have to learn the other. Yeah. Yet nutrition courses just teach nutrition and farming courses just teach farming. And the two don't seem to come together often enough. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it was sort of stunning for me to learn about all this because you know the answers were all there and it was such a complete picture. I mean, it was just beautiful in its completeness. So when the animals are happy, it means that they're eating grass and that means that habitat's being restored and carbon's being sequestered and all of that good stuff is happening. But it also makes a very different animal product. When you compare animals that are eating the food they're meant to eat, living the lives they're meant to live with this horrible situations of factory farming, they're actually really different products at the end of the day. Um, omega-6, omega-3 ratio is completely different. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with that, but the omega-6s are responsible for inflammation and omega-3s are responsible for calming inflammation. You need a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. The problem is these agricultural-based diets, it's all grain and it's all omega-6s. So it's all inflammation all the time and almost no omega-3s. Um, when you feed grain to cows, their milk and their meat, the products that come out of those animals are then also completely wrong. It's all these omega-6s and no omega-3s. It only takes three days of grain feeding for the cows, you know, the, the fats and proteins in the body to change. So as quick as that, I, wow. it's, I know it's, it's like almost instantaneous. They suddenly, there's no omega no, no omega-3s to be found anywhere in the cow. And it's, it's just like overnight essentially. So um, all isn't of that, that is just, Isn't that strange that grain finished is often talked about as being the better type of beef that's been grain finished. I mean, that, that to me is absolutely a, an industrial myth. Right yeah. Here. yeah. Well, it marbles the fat, right? And everybody thinks that's great. Um, it's not, but <laughs> that's, you know, sort of the myth that we all have. A lot of this is it's, it's place dependent. It's breed dependent. Like they bred cows now that respond better to, you know, eating huge amounts of corn. Um, 
if we can go back to the standard breeds that grow on grass um, really well, it's, you, you know, immediately the stuff tastes better, it looks better. Um, you don't have those kinds of, you know, the tough, tough problem with the meat. Um, the best hamburger I ever had was honestly from Angus beef raised in Scotland on grass. Mm -hmm. I had that burger in London once and I, it was the best burger ever. And it's like, yes, of course, Angus beef from Scotland. Like where else would it be from? Eating the grass that evolved to eat. It was like such a good hamburger. It's like shining moment in my food life, that burger. Um, but it's the same everywhere, right? Like the cows that are meant to eat that grass in that place will produce a, a very fine product, but it will be a nutritionally appropriate for humans is really the point. Think about it. We evolved eating what? The giant ruminants on the African savanna. Of course, those are the fats and proteins that are going to match our nutritional profile, our evolutionary template. And there they are. All we have to do is let the cows and the bison and whoever have their lives back and we'll have perfect nutrition too. Oh, the other thing that happens when you give cows corn is that um, corn is very low in tryptophan, that's an amino acid. Um, and tryptophan is the precursor to serotonin. So a lot of people kind of know about this uh, already from the depression world. Um, but... So when you feed them corn, they don't have enough tryptophan in the end products. And this is another reason I think why we've had this just huge upswing in depression you know, over the last few decades is the lack of tryptophan. You can only make serotonin from tryptophan. That's the precursor. If you don't eat it, you don't have any. We can't make it on our own. Um, and by eating factory farmed animals, we're not getting any tryptophan. Like even if you just ate meat morning, noon, and night, if it was meat from a factory farm, you're not getting enough tryptophan. Is the that, only is way that true of, uh, of turkey and chicken as well uh, that are well known for being higher in tryptophan? I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not as not as sure about the chicken and the turkey because they do have very different um, digestive systems. I do know that grass-fed beef way, way outperforms turkey right. with tryptophan. So it's really the best thing to eat is grass-fed beef if you're depressed. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. And I imagine as well there's many of those principles that we could apply to plant production as well that, you know, we, we talk a lot about industrial animal agriculture being a problem, but... I think too often, perhaps in, in the plant-based food circles, we tend to ignore industrially produced plants and the problems that they create. To finish us off, because uh, we're nearly on time here, any thoughts on that particular subject? We'll start from the very beginning. What is agriculture? You take a piece of land, you clear every living thing off it, and I mean down to the bacteria, and then you plant it for human use. Mm. So it's biotic cleansing. I mean, literally everything that was supposed to live there is gone. It has nowhere to go. And right now, this very day, 200 species go extinct every single day on this planet. And it's because of agriculture, ultimately. It's because of agricultural societies. Um, the, the, so that's what it is, right? You're clearing all the land off. You're only growing humans. What this means is temporarily the human population can expand um, mm -hmm. because you're not sharing that land, right? For a, a hunter-gatherer in this climate, it took about a square mile to support a human. And an agriculturalist can do that on an acre or two. But it's because you're not sharing that land. Mm -hmm. Well, because you're not sharing it, what it means is you're destroying the soil. Year by year, there's going to be less and less soil. The soil can't take that. It's being mined. Um, and it's also just evaporating. And where it's going is up into the atmosphere. So all that carbon. The beginning of global warming is not actually the industrial age. It's not the year 1800. You back it up 6,000 years. It's the beginning of agriculture. Especially mm -hmm. rice agriculture is particularly bad for the atmosphere, but and it's because of the soil. That's all. It, that they vaporize the soil, actually, and it's all up there now. We've got to to sequester it. I mean, and that's the only way is to get it back into the soil. Mm -hmm. um, but none of this is stuff that you know vegans or vegetarians think about, um, because most of us don't think about it. I, I don't want to single them out, but it's just that they make a claim that their food is you know so ecologically wonderful and there's no death. And I'm like, it's massive death. We have cleared out 98% of the world's old growth forests and 99% of the world's prairies are gone. All we're doing is supporting humans on that land now. Mm. There's no way you can call that friendly to animals. 98% of their home is gone. All, they're all, they've been driven into extinction. That's what agriculture is on the best possible day. That's what it is. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not, and it's also destroyed human societies as well. I mean, if there was more time, we could talk about militarism and genocide and patriarchy and all of the social forms that follow once you take up agriculture, inevitably, because it's drawdown. You're destroying your land. You have to go out and take somebody else's. This is why agricultural societies end up militarized every time, why they end up imperialist every time. Um, it hasn't, it's been a disaster for the planet, but it's also been a disaster for human health and also for human society. 
But could you uh, could you finish us off by you've kind of alluded to some of this already during the conversation? But could you finish <laughs> us off by uh, suggesting what uh, maybe maybe even reiterating because you've kind of said some of these things? What the the key solutions are? If you were to bullet point those solutions, what do you think we need to do to try and resolve nutrition and to resolve our environmental problems? Build topsoil. That's honestly it. Anything that helps build topsoil will cure all of these problems. And anything that doesn't is the problem. Um, and that's true politically, it's true economically, it's true for your health, it's true for the, the good of the animals, help them come home again. Um, it's the only thing we have left that's gonna save the climate, build topsoil. All right, so we can save the climate through uh, strengthening our topsoils and improve the nutrition of the foods that we eat by uh, harnessing methods that in increase topsoil. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and that's ruminants on grass. It's just that simple. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, Leah, it's been a really fascinating conversation. I appreciate your, your honesty and your candor. And, uh, you know, I'd like to, uh, to, to uh, remind the listeners that we're going to connect up with Leah's book. We'll also have that Oxford study that Leah mentioned about for you to, to find in the show notes. And uh, hopefully you can uh, get out there and perhaps really consider some of the, the, the concepts that we've talked about this today. Uh, Leah, thanks so much. I really wish you a very good day. Yeah, you too. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and share via social media. You can also rate the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. If you'd like to know more about us, then check out our range of online courses at www.nordicfitnesseducation.com.